insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 65, Sleep Anxiety. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my energetic and well-rested co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing all right. So this is our second take. We fired it up to begin with, and I kind of messed up, and we were getting double, triple, and quadruple sounds coming out. So... My apologies for the false start, but we, I think, are good to go right now. So uh, tell us a little bit about, well, before we get into that, I got to plug the show because I didn't do that last week correctly. So before we get into that, and before I jump ahead here, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of the podcast at Insights Into Teens. Video versions of all of our shows are available at Insights Into Things. You can get us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and Pandora. Uh, we also ask you to uh, reach out to us. Give us your feedback at comments at insightsintothings.com via email. You can get us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can hit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcasts. We are on Instagram at Insights Into Things, or you can give us feedback right through our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Okay, that's all done. So, sleep anxiety. This was kind of one that was inspired by you. So before we get into all the technical details and the research and stuff like that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with sleep anxiety? Well, um, I definitely know that, especially at the start, around like when I was 12 is when I think I first started fully experiencing sleep anxiety. And like, and I've definitely gotten better. Um, but, um, actually due to the long break, my sleep anxiety ended up kind of coming back. Um, I started stressing more, I couldn't sleep very well, and trying to fall asleep just wasn't helping. Right. So what we're describing as sleep anxiety is not a clinical description. I don't even know sleep anxiety has a clinical definition. But just for the purpose of this discussion, the sleep anxiety we're talking about is the inability to sleep and the stress from not being able to fall asleep, which can lead to further inability to fall asleep. Mm. And we'll talk about some of the things that cause the inability to sleep. Uh, We'll also talk about understanding kind of how sleep works, which I think is important because if you don't really know how sleep works, it's hard to know whether or not sleep anxiety is having an effect on you. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to talk about how sleep works. And then we'll talk about why do teens have trouble sleeping. And this is some of the causes that you've run into. Then we will talk about what are the benefits of deep sleep, which is going, we'll define that in the, in our first segment. And then we'll talk about how to increase deep sleep, what methods you can have uh, that you can use to try to improve that. Uh, but the first thing I think we, we're going to talk about is is an un, get an understanding of how sleep works. So let's get right into it. All righty. So this research comes to us from a source that, that we use quite frequently, kidshealth.org. 
And they talk about the stages of sleep. So there are multiple stages that our brains go through uh, when we sleep. There's five stages typically that we go through. And, um, you know, you have stage one through four. And then the final stage is, is REM. Have you ever heard of REM sleep? Uh, not really, no. Okay. So that's, that's really your deep sleep that you're going to get into here. Mm. So it's a sleep cycle takes you through all of these, all five of these sleep phases or, or sleep stages. Okay. And a sleep cycle during the night typically lasts between 90 and 100 minutes, which I think a lot of people would think that's kind of unusual because, you know, I sleep for six, seven, eight hours. But your body goes through this cycle as you progress through the phases, reach that final phase, you're there for a period, and then your body pulls itself back to the lower phases. Mm. So during an average night's sleep, you'll experience four or five cycles of sleep, which is pretty typical during a six-hour, seven-hour sleep cycle. Stages one and two are periods of light sleep from which a person can wake up easily. Okay. So during these stages, eye movements slow down and eventually stop. The heart and breathing rates slow down and the body temperature tends to decrease. Now, understanding what that sort of phase is, do you think you can feel when you're uh, in, in stage one or two sleep? You know, it's kind of like a nap. You know, how do you, do you have a recollection of when your body goes through that kind of sleep? I mean, sometimes, I think. Like, I don't nap on a regular basis. Um, but when I, I think when I do start the lighter stages, like, I know I'm sleeping somewhat and I'm kind of conscious of it. Yeah, for, for me, it's usually like if I'm, you know, sitting on the couch and it's nine o'clock at night and it's getting close to my time to go to bed and I'll doze off and then I'll be watching TV and, you know, I'll just, there'll be a, a flash of light or a, a sound or something from the TV and I'll wake up and I'm immediately alert at that point in time. That's what these one and stage one and stage twos are is that you can wake right up from it and you know, you're, you're right back in the saddle. You don't, you're not feeling groggy or anything. So your stage three and four are the deep sleep stages. These are where your body starts to regenerate. This is a type of sleep we crave when we're very tired. Mm. It's also the sleep stages where the body releases hormones that contribute to growth and development. So it's very important that teens reach these sleep stages as they're growing because this is how your body tends to grow. It's also how your body recuperates usually from a, a stressful or a rough day. Uh, and it's also where your body can start to heal itself better if you're injured. So the, that's why, you know, when you're sick, you get sleep. You get sleep because when you're in these stages, your body goes into this self-repair where it's growing, it's fixing and, and recuperating and re-energizing. Mm -hmm. So these two stages of sleep are, tend to be very important. Okay. Now, the problem that you run into is that during sleep anxiety, you may doze off because your body just naturally falls asleep. But because of that anxiety, your body doesn't let your, your brain go into that deeper sleep and you're more easily woken up too. Mm. Now, do you, when, you, when you're going through your sleep anxiety issues, do you feel that it's, it's hard for you to stay asleep or to go back to sleep when you wake up? I mean, yeah, when I do wake up, like, like, say I was, I had, like, slept, I had gone to bed at some, I would fallen asleep at some point and I wake up at, like, 3.30. Trying to fall back asleep before my alarm goes off is honestly really difficult. And sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Yeah, and that's usually a result of the anxiety that you have because you've come out of that lower level of sleep. Uh, the higher level of sleep, rather. When you come out of that lower level of sleep, you tend to be groggy and prone to like, you know, you'll wake up, you'll look at the, the alarm clock and you'll see, you know, it was time to get up. But if you lay your head back down, you're probably going to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the state of mind you're in when you're in those level three and four stages. 
And the final stage itself is REM. REM actually stands for rapid eye movement. Oh. So, like, you can see this in the cats. So the cats themselves go through the stage, too. And when the cats are in a deep sleep, you'll see their eyes move, or you'll see their tails move, or they'll sort of twitch or make noises in their sleep because they're dreaming. The REM sleep is where you, you tend to have your most vivid dreams. Ah. Oh. Other physical changes take place during REM sleep. Your breathing tends to be rapid. Your heart rate beats faster. And the limb muscles don't move. And this is a, an interesting phenomenon that we run into is that because your, your dreams tend to be so vivid in REM, they're very realistic. And your body naturally moves to stimuli like that. So when you go into REM sleep, your body... Your brain paralyzes your body kind of so it can't move. Mm. And that's to protect yourself because if, for instance, you feel like you're falling or you're running in your sleep, you're going to lash out and you might hurt yourself. So your, your brain sort of shuts down that motor part of your body so you can play out those scenarios in your head while you're dreaming, but you're not playing them out physically with your body. Ah. People that sleepwalk tend to be in a REM state, but that part of their brain doesn't shut down their body. Uh -oh. And they can get up and move around. It's very, very interesting. And it can be very dangerous if you try to wake somebody suddenly from that stage, too. So you have to be very careful. So, so REM sleep is really where we do most of our dreaming, but you don't need to get to a REM state to get that recuperative sleep. You really need to get to that stage four and stage five and your body naturally gets to that stage as long as you're not going through the anxiety that we referred to. So, pretty good idea of how sleep works at this point? Yeah. All right. Let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about why do teens have trouble sleeping? For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. This week we are talking sleep anxiety. So why do teens have trouble sleeping? Now, we've done a sleep podcast in the past where we've talked about sleep deprivation. Yep. Do you remember when we talked about that, what research tells us how many hours of sleep teens need? Um, it's okay. You can look at the notes and sheets. Uh, kidshealth.org. Right, right. And so how many hours do, do teens need typically? Uh, at least eight and a half. Right. So you don't have to be a math whiz to figure out that if you wake up for school at, say, six, you have to go to bed at nine in order to reach that nine-hour mark. Mm hmm Do you do that? Well, I go, well, I technically wake up at 6.30, but I go to bed at nine. So then you do fit into that, that realm. Of, but do you fall asleep when you go to bed? No, I do not. Right. So you're up for a little bit there. So you're probably running into a situation where that sleep anxiety is keeping you awake for a while when you go upstairs to go to bed. And, uh, you know, you're not getting that eight and a half hours of sleep. So you're a little sleep deprived like we had discussed before. Mm -hmm. And that tends to build up over time. Studies have found that many teens have trouble falling asleep that early. 
Go figure. You're you're you would be among that study, right? Yeah. So what do you typically do to try to fall asleep when you go to bed? Do you read, watch TV, listen to music? Well, typically I try to have some background noise and, like, just keeping my attention off of, like, thinking on my own is normally good. And typically having background noise or something on the TV kind of helps because, like, I can focus my attention on that and not focus on the fact that, like, I'm trying to fall asleep. So your inability to fall asleep isn't a lack of desire to want to fall asleep. It's that your brain is just very active at that stage in the evening, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because most teens' brains tend to work on later schedules. And you're not ready for bed at 9 o'clock, even though that's what time you'd need to go to bed to get the amount of sleep that you need. So it's kind of contradictory as far as your sleep schedule goes. During adolescence, the body's circadian rhythm. <clears throat> now, do you know what a circadian rhythm is? Uh, no. So a circadian rhythm, rhythm is sort of like your internal body clock. Ah. Um, it controls all the, the functions that your body does on a regular basis. You know, it controls your sleep. It controls your ability to heal. It controls your ability to manage your time to a certain extent. It's your perception of time in, in many cases. So anything that has to do with a timing related to biological stuff, that's part of your circadian rhythm. Oh. So the body's circadian rhythm resets in, in adolescence. So you, you adjust to it in your earlier years. Then it resets and it shifts the time a little bit there. So it's telling the teen to fall asleep later at night and to wake up later in the morning. Mm. And the demand that your body has for, for getting this rest conflicts with it. So that's a natural thing. You know, all teens experience that. It isn't something that's unique to you or any other individual. So the change in circadian rhythm happens because teens' brains produce the hormone melatonin late at night. And it's later in uh, kids and adults. So melatonin, I actually take melatonin supplements to help me sleep. That's a natural chemical that the body produces that helps to, to promote calmness and eventually drowsiness in the body. Mm. And this works with other hormones like serotonin that help to regulate the person's sleep and wake cycle. So that's a lot of what you run into with sleep is it's very chemical based. And because teens are going through so many rapid changes as they grow, their body produces the chemicals at different rates than others. Oh. Um, so I'm sure you probably have friends that don't have sleep problems at this point in time, even though you might be having sleep problems. Yeah. And that's just because they're developing at a different stage or different rate than you are. Mm -hmm. But that's natural. Not everyone is the same. Everyone is very unique when it comes to that sort of thing. Mm. So as a result of all this, teens have a harder time falling asleep, as you've experienced. So sometimes this can be so severe that it affects your daily activities. Oh. So if you're not getting enough sleep, you may be falling asleep in class. Or you might not be able to concentrate as well because your body is, needs that sleep and you're not getting it and it builds up over time. Cases like this are often called delayed sleep phase syndrome or night owl syndrome. Mm. So that very well could be something that you're experiencing that's manifesting itself with sleep anxiety. Mm. But these aren't the only reasons that teens lose sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of teens do have insomnia. Insomnia is just a natural ability to fall asleep or to stay asleep. I don't think you have that problem because typically people with insomnia literally are up all night long and can't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, there were periods of time that I had suffered through it back when I was working at a different job a long time ago. And the work schedule that I had induced insomnia on me because I had to work overnights 
a couple of nights a week and then I was on a regular schedule and it really just really played around with my body clock too much. Mm. So emotional troubles could cause issues as well. So you insomnia itself can lead to physical discomfort. It can lead to emotional issues. But you're not experiencing a lot of these. So some of the physical issues that you can run into are stuffy nose or cold or pain or headaches, none of which you seem to be going through. So I don't think insomnia really is the issue. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things is exposing yourself to excessive light, like using mobile devices or watching TV. So one of the things that they do try to tell you to do is to reduce the amount of blue light that you consume visually before you go to sleep. Okay. So you'll see a lot of TVs now have a night mode or your phone has a night mode. And when the night mode kicks in, it cuts down on the amount of blue on the display itself. And you tend to get more of an amber um, sepia type glow. Um, because the blue actually triggers uh, certain activities in the brain that keep you awake. Uh. Which a lot of people don't realize that the color of light that you, and the temperature, they tend to refer to it as a temperature. So stuff that's more in that blue spectrum is, is a cool light. Stuff that's more in the red spectrum is a warm light. So the warmer the light you have when you go to sleep, the better off you can actually fall asleep and stay asleep. Uh. Which one of the things that we do here is we tend to set the hallway light to blue, which is probably the single worst color that we could do for helping people actually go to sleep and stay asleep. Uh, really, we should be setting that to like a yellow or a red or something like that, which also helps with your night vision too, by the way. Hmm. So it's common for people to have insomnia from time to time, but if it lasts for a month or longer, you probably need to see a, a doctor. Mm. to get some help for that. Chronic insomnia can be uh, caused by a number of different things like a medical condition, mental health issues, uh, medication side effects, substance abuse. So if you have chronic insomnia, there's probably a medical issue that needs to be attended to. Mm. So wearing a bad insomnia can make it even worse, which is kind of you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain extent, I guess. Mm. But there are other common sleep problems that you might run into, and I want to run these past you and see if you experience these. Okay. So occasionally people run into what's called PLMD or RLS. Uh, PLMD is periodic limb movement disorder or also referred to as restless leg syndrome. So this is something where you have discomfort in your lower extremities, your feet, your ankles, your calves, and so forth. And it can feel like a burning or a tickling or spikes like pins and needles type thing. And it makes it very difficult for you to fall asleep. Do you experience anything like this when you fall, try to fall asleep that it keeps you awake? I mean, sometimes, like, I'll have parts of my body that kind of itch and I need to move a little, and um, I definitely can't really stay in one place for very long, and sometimes, like, I need to switch my legs if they get too uncomfortable, and of course, if I keep one of my legs on top of one of, one of my legs on top of the other, my leg will start falling asleep and it'll feel like the pin, like pins and needles. Yeah, and this is something that I run into, and for me, it's it's most likely a circulation issue because of my diabetes. Uh, this is why I had that, that leg vibrator thing where you put your feet on it and vibrates. That actually helps to promote the circulation in, in your lower legs, and I would do that before I went to bed, and it would really help with that issue, so I have to get another one of those. Mm -hmm. But that's something that can certainly keep you awake. Uh. Uh, another one that's common, which I probably also suffer from, is called obstructive sleep apnea. A person with obstructive sleep apnea temporarily stops breathing during sleep because the airway becomes narrowed or blocked. 
One common cause of obstructive sleep apnea is enlarged tonsils or adenoids, the tissues that are located in the passage that connects the throat and the nose, uh, being overweight or obese, which clearly I am, can cause the problem as well. People with the sleep disorder may snore, um, which I don't snore, do I? I'm a pretty mm. bad snorer, I know. Yeah. Uh, they may have difficulty breathing and even sweat heavily during sleep. Because it disrupts sleep, a person may feel extremely sleepy or irritable during the day. Well, I'm irritable all the time, so. Uh, people who show signs of obstructive sleep apnea, such as loud snoring or excessive daytime sleepiness, should talk to their doctor. So do you think this might be something that you run into? Do you find that you wake up gasping for breath or wake up and you're sweating or anything like that? And do you snore? Well, I'm not entirely sure if I snore or not. Do you know if I snore? I don't think you snore. Yeah, I know I don't snore. I don't always wake up like gasping for air when I... I mean, typically that would happen if I had a nightmare because I'd just be scared. Um... But, and normally I'm not sweaty unless, like, I had a real, like, my room was really warm. Yeah. So I don't think you suffer from uh, sleep apnea or, or obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. The next one that they talk about is reflux. Uh, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. Stomach acid moves backwards up the esophagus producing the uncomfortable burning sensation known as heartburn. GERD symptoms can be worse when someone's lying down. Even if a person doesn't notice the feelings of heartburn during sleep, the discomfort it causes can, stir, can still interfere with the sleep cycle. So, you know, if you've ever vomited a little bit, which, you know, I don't want to get disgusting or anything, what happens is you have reflux you have acids that come up from the stomach and it burns your throat mm -hmm. well gerd is the there's a there's a little door we'll call it that that stops that from coming up people that suffer from gerd do not it doesn't seal properly so when your stomach is upset or if you're laying down and you're at a certain angle that that acid can flow back up the esophagus and cause discomfort and cause you to choke and gasp for air and so forth. That one I know you don't suffer from at this point, so it's worth mentioning, but not something that I think we need to deal with. Nightmares. Nightmares. I think we all have nightmares at some point in time. Mm -hmm. So most teens have nightmares once in a while. But frequent nightmares can disrupt sleep patterns by waking someone during the night. The most common triggers for more frequent nightmares are emotion, uh, emotional, such as stress or anxiety. Other things that can trigger them include certain medicines and consuming drugs or alcohol. Sleep deprivation also can lead to nightmares, so, which is really ironic because the less sleep you get, the more your brain can trigger nightmares that forces you to get even less sleep. So, do you suffer from nightmares occasionally? Well, I always have, like, one or two nightmares, but it's definitely not on a regular basis to the point where, like, every night I, like, wake up in a cold sweat, like, just scared. Um, I, I don't remember... Um... The last nightmare I had was a pretty long time ago, so I really don't have nightmares or dreams for that matter. So, um, I really don't have this problem. Good. Well, that's good because nightmares are something that can really cause problems because they, in, in and of themselves, can cause anxiety. Yeah, I have to be honest. Although some of my nightmares were weird, a lot of them were really terrifying. That. Well, that's why they're nightmares and not dreams, right? Yeah. So the next thing they talk about is narcolepsy. People with narcolepsy are often very sleepy during the day and have sleep attacks, quote-unquote, that may make them suddenly fall asleep, lose muscle control, or see vivid dreamlike images while dozing off or waking up. Someone's nighttime sleep may be disrupted, 
with frequent awakenings throughout the night. Again, this is something that you don't suffer from, but narcolepsy is a legitimate medical issue, and if you do feel that you're suffering from it, that's something where you probably need to see a medical professional. Mm. And the last one they talk about is sleepwalking. And we kind of briefly talked about this. It's rare for teens to sleep, to walk in their sleep. Most sleepwalkers are kids. Sleepwalking, which may run in families, tends to happen more often when a person is sick, has a fever, or is not getting enough sleep, or is feeling stress. So again, it's, a, it's something that can be prevent you from sleeping and compound the lack of sleep issues. So it can be caused by a lack of sleep and it causes a lack of sleep. Mm. But it's also something that can be stress-induced. So again, a lot of what we talk about on this podcast is how to cope with stress. Everyone goes through stress. Everyone handles it differently. Everyone has different stresses. So learning how to deal with stress makes your life much easier. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the sleep issues that people run into are stress-related. Mm. So before we break, since that was the last thing that we had for this segment, I wanted to ask you, do you think there are stresses that are factoring into your uh, sleep anxiety? And if so, what are those stresses? Hmm. Well, I do feel as though some stresses do kind of contribute to me not being able to sleep. Typically, like, before test or quizzes stress. I seem to have that problem where, like, I stress over tests and quizzes, like, the night of, even though most of the time I know what I'm doing. Um, and a lot of times my body basically, like, tells me the worst is gonna happen, as opposed to thinking about the worst and planning for if the worst happens. So, I have that kind of anxiety just about, like, okay, here's what's gonna happen tomorrow, it's gonna be bad. And, like, that's kind of what keeps me awake sometimes, thinking right. about, like, like, all, like, bad stuff that could happen during the day. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So let's take a quick break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about what some of the benefits of deep sleep are. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We're talking about what the benefits of deep sleep are. So when you get into those stage three, stage four phases of sleep, uh, glucose metabolism in the brain increases during those stages. And these support short-term and long-term memory and overall learning. Mm. Uh, deep sleep is also where the pituitary gland secretes important hormones like human growth hormone, leading to the growth and development of the human body, which is obviously very important for teens. Mm. So... Why don't you give us a rundown the list of, of other benefits that deep sleep has for us? Okay, so some of the other benefits are energy restoration, uh, cell regeneration, increasing blood supply to muscles, promoting growth and repair of tissues and bones, strengthen and strengthening the immune system. Right, so these are all things that teens need, you know, we all need energy restoration. That's what that 
you know, gives us that rest it and ready to go feeling in the morning. Uh, cell regeneration is what allows us to repair damage to the body. If we have injuries, uh, sickness, and so forth. Mm. Increasing blood supply to the muscles. As teens grow, they build muscles naturally. So increased blood supply to the muscles helps there, as well as promoting growth and repairing the tissues. Mm. You know, muscles grow by actually tearing muscle fibers and then having them grow back stronger. Mm. So a lot of that repair happens when you're sleeping. And it strengthens the immune system. Uh, just the glucose properties, the, the um, glucose metabolism helps with um, promoting a, a stronger immune system as well. So all of these things are really what you need in teens by getting that deep sleep. And the less of that you get, um, the less of the deep sleep you get, the fewer the benefits. Mm. So even though you may sleep, if you're not getting to that stage three and stage four sleep, the sleep is not as beneficial as it should be. Mm. Like, for instance, the one thing that I tend to run into is I, you know, I've got pain issues that I deal with. So when I sleep, I may only sleep for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. I'll doze off, I'll nap, I'll wake up. Then I'll reposition, I'll doze off, I'll nap, I'll wake up. But the pain keeps waking me up. So as a result, I never, or I infrequently, I should say, reach these deep sleep stages where it would really help energize me and repair the body. Mm. Do you find when you have anxiety sleeping that when you wake up, you're not rested, that you didn't feel like you got a good night's sleep? I mean... Sometimes, probably um, during school nights when I do end up waking up earlier than my alarm, sometimes I do feel as though I'm not fully, I didn't get the full rest that I needed. And during the day, especially in the morning, I'm really tired. Yeah. So if, if you're feeling that fatigue during the day, you probably didn't experience a lot of these beneficial effects the night before either. Mm. Uh, so. It's important that we get that deep sleep. Yeah. If you sleep eight hours but toss and turn all night, you may not get enough sleep, enough deep sleep. It's impossible to force your brain to go into deep sleep, but there are a number of strategies that have shown some promise in terms of increasing your percentage of deep sleep. So I want to run these down here and see what your thoughts are on these. Alrighty. So the first one they talk about is to put yourself on a bedtime schedule where you go to sleep and wake up at the same time each day. Is that something that you do and do you find that that works for you or do you deviate that from that schedule maybe on the weekends or holidays? I mean, yeah, I kind of deviated from the weekends or holidays, but for the most part during the weekdays when I do have school, I do follow that kind of schedule. And it does kind of help me get a good way of falling asleep and getting back into like getting having that regular schedule kind of stops me from waking up because like on Mondays, like sometimes I might wake up um, before my alarm, but usually by the end of the week, I'm able to um, I'm able to fully sleep okay good they also say stick to water and other decaffeinated drinks before bed caffeine alcohol which you won't have nicotine which you won't have may make it harder to get a good night's rest so you don't drink a lot of caffeine now though do you well not entirely i don't like try it I don't like try having a lot of caffeine, but I do drink soda, so, um, well, normally at lunch, I used to drink it at dinner, but after everything and realizing that maybe I should cut off on the caffeine, I started drinking non-caffeine drinks at, um, at, uh, dinner. So is there a point at night where you have a cutoff where you don't have that kind of drink and you switch over to water? Um, yeah, sometimes when I do get thirsty at night, I have, um, I have a water bottle that I keep on my, on the side that I would drink if I was thirsty. Okay. Now, do you, and that's throughout the night though, right? Yeah. But is there a point like after dinner where you stop drinking caffeine? Um, 
well, I kind of stopped drinking caffeine by lunch, or as long I try to stop drinking caffeine by lunch, like, um, like, I have, um, soda for lunch, but then throughout the rest of the day, I won't have soda for the rest of the time, um, and just have a different type of drink, okay. and then through dinner, at, then after dinner, I really just have water. Okay. The next thing they talk about is reducing stress can help sleep. We've talked about this already. We do know that teens always deal with stress. So, so you know, just to emphasize that coping with stress is a way to, to improve your sleep. They suggest to create a bedtime routine to unwind for the day, like reading a book or taking a bath. What do you do? What's your wind down routine in the evenings before you go to bed? Well, um, an hour before I go to bed, typically me and mommy would go downstairs and, uh, watch something on the TV for a bit of, um, mother-daughter time, as well as to kind of get off technology and just chill. Okay. Um. Is there anything else? Do you read or anything? Sometimes I'd read, um, just to, like, get my mind, just to relax, and just to, do uh, calm my nerves. Other times I'd listen to music to calm my nerves, so. Okay. I have various techniques. But do those techniques tend to work for you? Uh, reading normally always kind of puts me in, like, a drowsy mood, and listening to music puts me in a calm mindset so that I really don't think too much about it, my anxieties. Okay. Well, that's good. I personally tend to read before I go to bed, and, and reading usually helps to keep helps to calm me down i, I keep a a kindle so i read uh, ebooks at night um, which is nice because i can adjust that light to a point where it's not disturbing me yeah banish bright lights and loud noises from your bedroom too much tv or computer time may make it hard to relax now we've kind of found this out to be true with you where if you were watching tv up to a certain point or on your digital devices too late at night, it was causing a problem. Now, we've cut back on that now. Has that helped you sleep better? Yeah, it's definitely helped me sleep better. I'm slightly more calm, and I don't think too much, but I still, you know, have some parts of anxiety. Sure, yeah. Well, and, and some of that you're just not going to get it, get rid of. Yeah. Uh, sleep in a cool room. That's something that I certainly always try to do to the point that uh, poor mommy has to suffer through my cold spells. Uh, but how do you feel? Do you feel that you, you prefer sleeping in a cool environment or do you like it nice and warm? I like it in a cool environment. Like, you're already under the blanket. You might as well get warm with it. Um, You don't want to have a room, like, too warm because then you kind of get sweaty and you can't really... And I just think you get uncomfortable while with being cold if you're a little cold just put a blanket on and that kind of helps sure yeah. get plenty of exercise about 20 to 30 minutes each day is a good start uh, just avoid working out in the hours before bedtime how is your exercise i know you have an exercise log for school that you have to do do you find the days that you exert yourself more you tend to sleep better um yeah, um, I typically, like, normally do, like, just dance downstairs, and when I do get, um, that exercise, I do seem to sleep better. Um, I can't entirely tell what the effects are, because I've kind of been doing those exercises for most of the time, um, except maybe on the week, on some days of the week weekend, but for the most part, during the whole week, I'm kind of dancing, and... Uh, I am able to fall asleep pretty well. Now, do you have days where you may wind up doing more exercise than normal because of certain things you do in gym class? And if you do, does that affect your sleep? I mean, sometimes I do it more, mainly, like, if I am worried. Like, it's a good way to stop me from worrying, and gym is kind of... I kind of have that as my, like, starting point if, like... Like, for the most part, for gym, I work out uh, with dancing for 25 minutes, and sometimes 
um, when I do have them, um, I'd work out a little more, um, later because I might feel, like, worried at some point or I just want to get a little more exercise in. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that, I feel as though those nights I seem to sleep a little better. Eating a healthy diet. Now, I know, obviously, I don't really eat a healthy diet very often, but I do know, you know, when mommy feeds me <laughs> healthy food, which she's very good at, uh, despite my best efforts to avoid it, uh, I find I tend to eat better when I'm eating healthy. Is that, do you experience the same type of effect? You mean sleep better when you eat healthy. You said eat better when you eat healthy. Yeah, that that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say that not having a bunch of sugar or any not having a bunch of sugar from like desserts and stuff immediately injected into you kind of helps me sleep better. Having a healthy balanced diet um helps with that and not having too much sugar always. Okay. What about listening to white noise or pink noise? Mommy and I, we sleep with uh, the meditation music turned on, which is kind of like white noise in the background. But do you sleep with music in the background or do you sleep with sound in, in the background in general? Kind of sleep with like um, quiet sound in the background because just having like some type of sound kind of helps and I guess that kind of like puts my mind on what I know is happening um is going on so okay yeah one of the things that I find is that if I don't have a fan on I have trouble sleeping and part of that is the air that it blows obviously to keep me cool but another part of it is if it's not a semi-noisy fan to have that droning in the background, I have a difficult time. I cannot sleep when it's completely silent. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, when um, it was summer and I had my air conditioning on at night, like, I'd gotten so used to the sound that when I had to start, when I had to stop keeping my air conditioning on, it was kind of harder to fall asleep. Yeah, I go through the same exact thing. The next thing they talk about is meditation. Now, we've talked about a couple of different types of meditation. Uh, we haven't talked about it on the podcast yet. We do have a an upcoming podcast on mindful meditation. But there's a lot of different types of meditation that, that we've talked about offline. Do you apply any type of meditation technique to help you sleep when you're having trouble? I mean, I try to calm my breathing um, and at least try to, uh, calm my brain in some instances so that I don't think too much about it. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it only makes it worse, and I have to go to you guys for it, and you guys get upset because I have to wake you up. Ah, <laughs> uh, we don't get upset, but, you know, nobody likes to wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah. Especially when you have trouble going to sleep to begin with like I do. Yeah. Consider replacing your pillows if you've had them for over a year and have trouble getting comfortable. Do you find your sleeping space, uh, your bed, your pillows, your blankets, your pile of stuffed animals, uh, do you find it comfortable for you or do you think maybe there's a lack of comfort that's causing sleep problems? I mean, it's a decent comfort. I definitely don't think it's... I mean, like, sometimes I do toss and turn, but for the most part, I do get comfortable. Um, but I have noticed that, like, when I go on your bed, your mattress is a lot more comfortable than mine, I've noticed. Now, I don't know if it's just the fact that when I'm awake, or, like, like it seems more comfortable, and it's just a psychological thing with the fact of, of course, the fact of sleep anxiety and such, um... So, there's kind of a lot that factor into it. Um, I would say that I have a pretty decent um, sleep area. It's just, I guess it's just kind of the psychological thing sometimes when I try to fall asleep and it's less comfortable than it actually seems. Because I do sit on my bed during the day and it is pretty comfortable. Yet, when I try to fall asleep, the comfort kind of goes down. Yeah, and, you know, it's we can certainly look at getting you a new bed, new mattress to try and make it more comfortable. That's not that big of a deal. Mm. 
So the last thing they talk about here, which is one that I think is probably the most important when you're experiencing sleep anxiety and one that we actually just talked about this week, don't lay in bed tossing and turning. Consider getting up and doing a light activity like reading until you're tired again. Sitting in bed tossing and turning when you can't fall asleep is only going to drive that anxiety. It's going to make it harder for you to fall asleep. So if you're having trouble falling asleep, get up, sit up, read a book, read a magazine, uh, listen to music, do something to occupy your mind so that your body can get back into that, that peaceful, even state so you can fall asleep. Um, how do you feel about that? I know you're, you're apprehensive about getting up when you're supposed to be asleep, you tend to get a little paranoid about not getting sleep. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Tossing and turning does only drive my anxiety forward. And I did have to say the one time when I was tossing and turning and you guys told me to come down, um, although I really was kind of hesitant, it did end up helping me fall asleep and it was much better than just tossing and turning. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's really the trick, you know, don't, don't fight it. You know, if your body's not ready to go to sleep now for whatever reason, let's get up and let's, let's try to occupy our mind. Let's do something to distract ourselves until we're ready to go to sleep. Uh, fighting, it's just going to make you more anxious and give you more stress. So that was all we really had for today. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get your closing thoughts. Go for your closing thoughts. Okay, so to everyone out there who is experiencing sleep anxiety, there are plenty of ways out there that you can at least try to help you get a better sleep. Sleep is just really strange, and there's a lot of ways to try and help it. Nothing completely, like, certified to immediately help, but stuff that definitely could help. Okay, good thoughts. Thank you. Uh, before we go, I would invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can get us uh, audio versions of the podcast by searching for Insights into Teens. Video versions of this and all of our podcasts uh, come out on Insights into Things. You can check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, uh, Pandora, and something else, Amazon. Yeah, that's right. We're on Amazon, too. Uh, we would also invite folks to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We stream at least six days a week on Twitch at uh, twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. If you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, you do get a free Twitch Prime subscription. Uh, that we would appreciate you throwing our way. You can get us on Twitter at insights into, uh, at insights underscore things. You can get high res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Audio versions can be found at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we are at insights into things where you can get links to all those and much more on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. And you. And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights and Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother Sam. Well done. I think that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>